At the height of its power, the Mughal Empire controlled an estimated one quarter of the Earth's economy. Its massive population of over 150 million people was double that of the European continent at the time. This colossal state had very unlikely origins. One year after Christopher Columbus discovered the New World and failed to find a quicker route to India, a 11-year-old soon-to-be fugitive on the other side of the planet named Zahir al-Din, later known simply as Babur, meaning the tiger, had just inherited his father's tiny kingdom of Fergana. Over the next few years, he desperately tried to survive his family. Both his paternal and maternal uncles controlled armies with the goal of ending his life. On his father's side, Babur was descended from the Turco-Mongol warlord Tamerlane and Genghis Khan on his mother's side. Throughout his teen years, he repeatedly captured and lost control of the old Timurid capital of Samarkand and his home of Fergana. After decades of his disunited family butchering each other, the weakened remnants of the once mighty Timurid Empire were swept aside by the Turkic Uzbeks and the Iranian Safavid Persians. After suffering a series of major defeats, Babur was left homeless and surrounded by enemies yet again. He was accompanied by his mother, a few of his dead father's loyal friends, and a small number of mercenaries with questionable loyalties and little money. As his great-grandfather Tamerlane had done a century before, Babur took refuge in the mountains of Afghanistan. There he bided his time, and expanded his small band of followers into an army, seizing control of the strategically important city of Kabul in 1504. Babur maintained friendly relations with the Safavid Persians, from where he obtained his first firearms, cannon, and experts in their use. After losing and retaking Kabul, and another ultimately failed campaign to retake Samarkand from the Uzbeks, Babur turned his ambitions to a greater prize than war-torn Central Asia, the declining but still fabulously wealthy Delhi Sultanate. At the Battle of Panipat, a much smaller Timurid army used matchlock firearms and cannon behind an entrenched barricade of 700 carts, in tandem with nomadic horse archers to great effect to defeat a much larger traditional Indian army with 1,000 elephants at the vanguard. In the following year, Babur defeated a confederation of Rajput states, solidifying his control over northern India. Babur did not get to enjoy his lifelong dream of establishing a great empire for very long. At the age of 47, he died of a sudden illness, some suspected poisoning. His not very popular son Humayun succeeded him, and faced multiple revolts, rebellions, and attacks from his brothers. But he was ultimately defeated and driven out of the Indian subcontinent by one of his own generals, the Afghan Farid Khan, who established the short-lived Suri Empire. Like his father before him, Humayun became a fugitive, taking refuge in the mountains and desert. A younger brother refused him amnesty in Kabul, before finally finding safety in Safavid Persia, by which time his vast army had been whittled down to 40 men, who had survived by eating horse meat boiled in their helmets. When the deposed, disheveled, and beleaguered Mughal emperor arrived at the Persian imperial court, he only had a few rupees to give as a symbolic gift to the Shah and Shah. In return for this, and converting to Shia Islam, he received an army of 12,000 of the Shah's best men, which he used to defeat his brother and take Kabul. In 1555, he decisively defeated the Suri and re-established the Mughal Empire. A year later, he died after sustaining mortal wounds at the library, where he tripped and fell down a stone staircase. His son Akbar is often considered the greatest of Mughal emperors. During his nearly half-century reign, he greatly expanded the empire. In true Mongol fashion, he severely and extremely dealt with all dissent, rebellion, and military opposition. However, he is best remembered for being a patron of the arts, architects, and scholars of all kinds. Akbar was exceptional in his religious toleration for the time. He encouraged peaceful religious debate and outlawed forced conversions and any discrimination based on religion. He married wives who practiced a variety of faiths, including a Hindu Rajput wife who remained a practicing Hindu, with whom he had a son. Jahangir, who succeeded him as emperor. Although considered weak or decadent by many of his contemporaries, Jahangir was a competent military commander. His reign was also relatively peaceful and prosperous, and he continued to maintain close diplomatic relations with the Safavid Persians, as his father and grandfather had done. Jahangir also married a Hindu Rajput princess, who he made empress. 
However, his reign marked the beginning of a gradual change in the religiously tolerant policies of his father, his execution of a Sikh guru being the most notorious example. After Jahangir's death, a short civil war was fought between two of his younger sons. Upon securing the throne, Shah Jahan had his brothers executed by his grand vizier. Early in his reign, an unusually severe famine took the lives of two million people. Despite this, a series of rebellions, and a brief inconclusive war with the Safavids, his long reign was relatively peaceful and prosperous. Shah Jahan is best remembered for the construction of his beloved wife's tomb, the Taj Mahal. Although empress for just three years, she wielded considerable power and prestige, including the use of the imperial seal, making her edicts, declarations, and messages carry the full authority of the emperor. Shah Jahan's reign is widely considered to be the height of Mughal prestige, internal stability, and prosperity. His death set off a war of succession among his four sons, in which his third eldest son, Aurangzeb, emerged victorious. Aurangzeb expanded the empire to its greatest territorial extent. However, this was done at a great cost. Aurangzeb cut funding for the imperial court, arts, academics, and nearly everything not military in nature. A variety of taxes were increased or introduced, including the incredibly unpopular jizya tax on all non-Muslims, which was introduced throughout the empire. Because his policies encouraged constant rebellion, notably with the Rajputs, Marathas on the Deccan Plateau, and the Sikhs in the Punjab, his military camp has been described as a massive moving capital city. Millions of soldiers and civilians died during his constant campaigning, many indirectly, by the spread of famine and disease throughout war-torn regions. Aurangzeb's death was followed by another costly civil war. Taking advantage of the Mughals' internal strife, the Sikhs carved out a state for a short time. After another civil war, the Mughals became strong enough to reconquer lost territory from the Sikhs. While temporarily successful in the west, the wealthy region of Bengal in the east seceded from the empire in 1717. The Mughals did not effectively react to this, as they became embroiled in palace intrigue. The powerful Mughal noblemen, the Said brothers, seized power in the empire, deposing and installing emperors at will. In one year alone, 1719, four different emperors sat on the throne in Delhi. The fourth, Muhammad Shah, was able to rally support and defeat the Said brothers, internally stabilizing the state for a short while. As costly wars of attrition, with the Marathas and Sikhs dragged on, a new unexpected threat arrived in the subcontinent, the warlord Nadir Shah, founder of the Afsharid dynasty of Persia. He waged a rapid campaign and decisively defeated much larger Mughal armies. In March 1739, he sacked the Mughal capital of Delhi, slaughtering many civilians and carrying off the city's great riches. This rapidly accelerated the decline of the empire. Muhammad Shah was killed in battle by another new foreign invader, the French. In the years following his death, Bengal was defeated by the British East India Company and became a base for their operations against the Hindu Maratha Empire, which conquered the south of the Mughal Empire, while the north was taken by the Afghan Durrani Empire, which rose to prominence after the death of Nadir Shah. The remaining fragment of the Mughal Empire petitioned the Afghans for assistance against the rapidly expanding Marathas. This led to the Third Battle of Panipat, where the Marathas suffered heavy casualties and their expansion checked. The Afghans, who also suffered heavy casualties, were driven out of the Indian subcontinent by the Sikhs. In 1771, the Marathas captured Delhi and then declared themselves the protectors of the emperor, who became a hostage puppet. The British East India Company fought three wars with the Marathas to conquer most of the Indian subcontinent. Upon taking Delhi, the company assumed the role as the protector of the Mughal Emperor, as the Marathas had done before. Despite his lack of tangible power, the reputation and prestige of the Emperor was used by the company to influence the population. This charade came to an end after the Indian Rebellion of 1857, where many nobles and commoners alike declared the Emperor as the sole and legitimate authority in the land. In the aftermath, the Emperor was put on trial and exiled to Burma where the last Mughal emperor died in 1862. Queen Victoria succeeded him as Empress of India, ending company rule in the subcontinent and beginning the British Raj. So who were the Mughals? I would say they were a Persianized Turco-Mongol warrior aristocracy that ruled large parts of the Indian subcontinent for approximately 300 years. 
Let me know what you think down in the comments. Was Aurangzeb or Akbar a better representative of what the Mughals wear? This has been Epimetheus, and I would like to thank my patrons over on Patreon, who help with the cost of running this channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as that also really helps me out.